Everybody, can everybody hear me? I am Joel Fields, Wilbur Ellis Company, and today I'm going to talk about forest vegetation management. So um, first I'll give you a little introduction to myself. So I am a sales representative, a crop consultant, um, all sorts of different jobs, but um, I work for Wilbur Ellis and we are a distributor in Spokane and we cover an area of Eastern Washington, North Idaho, Western Montana, basically from the Rockies to the Cascades, just out of our Spokane office. And we distrib distribute fertilizers, chemicals, all that kind of things, anything to grow a plant with. And, and, and for today's talk, how to kill a plant, a weed. Um, and I do want to tell everybody, we do not have a store. We are not a retail store. So we are a distributor to businesses and applicators, government agencies, people like that. But we're, I'm happy to give you recommendations and I'm happy to tell you where to find the products. For instance, at farm stores, um, ag retailers, you know, people like the county here. Got, got lots of ways to do it, but we really do not have a storefront in Spokane. So get that one out of the road there. Presentation on Zoom, not being your. Oh, I'm. I mean, I've got it on a slide presentation, but is it sharing? I would not be sharing yet. I'm not sure how to do that, honestly. Uh, let's go here. Um, sure. Let's see. Oh, which one is it? Let me that one. Oh wait, no. Um, that one. That one. Sure. Okay. You, go, you are screen sharing. There we go. Okay. Okay, so I think we're good to go now. So again, I'm going to talk about a couple different things. It's not forwarding here. Yeah. Oh. I guess if I do that. Yeah. Okay, so Let's talk about some reasons to spray in the forest or near trees. So you could do site prep prior to planting trees. You could spray because you want to release planted or natural trees from competition. You could want to spray noxious weeds in and around near trees. Maybe you're going to do some roadside brush control. You might want to do weed control near trees and pastures. Maybe you want to make a fire break. Get rid of invasive grass near trees. Or maybe you want to remove hardwoods and brush to create openings in your forest. But all that has to be done. And primarily, I'm talking about safety to conifer trees in this area. So how do we safely do those things around trees? I want to talk a little bit about product labeling. So on the left there, you see conifer production areas. So a lot of products that I sell are really geared towards industrial forest management. So People that want to grow trees to harvest them down the road, sell them for, you know, lumber, that type of thing. So they're going to have things like conifer plantations on the label. And that's for site prep prior to planting trees or for spraying over or near trees for release to improve conifer growth and survival. And then it also might have Christmas tree plantations on the label. And then on the right is more, I think, what most of you folks are here for spraying in or near forest site type sites. So could be natural areas, trails and trailheads, recreation areas, wildlife openings and habitat areas, or range and pasture sites that have trees in them. <laughs> and then forest and non-crop sites. So again, there's gonna be all sorts of different use sites on the label. We wanna make sure we're using the correct one when you pick a product to use. Okay, there we go. So for label and safety considerations, you wanna to check to see if your use site is allowed. You wanna check precautions on the label. There's always a precaution section on your pesticide label and see if it says don't use near trees or don't use in you know a, a forest, that type of thing. Check for precautions around trees. 
and then look at specific directions for rates around trees as well. All right, let's talk about some good forestry herbicides. So for that plantation Christmas tree side of things, we have things like Esplanad F, Aquanite, which is a forestry labeled glyphosate. We have Rotary, Amazapir, that's to kill brush. Transliner Sonora is probably one of my favorite products. It's to kill anything in that sunflower or thistle family, knapweeds, hawkweeds, all those kind of things. It's very safe around conifer trees. And then Velpar L we use a lot for establishing seedling conifers, Garlon and Vastland for brush and noxious weeds, Open Sight for noxious weeds, Oust for controlling grass, and Escort for controlling noxious weeds. So that's, again, that's your industrial forest management type products and Christmas trees. And then on the right, we have these products that are labeled for, you know, more forest sites, natural areas, pastures wildlife openings. Transline and Sonora. Sonora is the generic version of Transline, and I'm trying to get quarts of that in stock, but we do have gallons in stock. So Transline, you have to buy a whole two and a half. Sonora is gonna be a good option for a less expensive option there. And then open site, I'm gonna talk more about that one. Milestone and high noon, amino pyrrolid products. Whetstone, a generic amino pyrrolid. Weed R64, or just straight 2,4-D, has forested areas on the label. I'm going to talk a lot about Rejuvra at the end. That is my favorite new uh, herbicide because it controls annual grasses in the uh, in pastures, rangeland, forested areas. And that's typically what starts forest fires as they start in those annual grassy areas. And then Escort XP for Pound's Tongue, for instance, Prescott 2,4-D, I'm sorry, Clopyrrolid plus Triclopyr, and then your Triclopyrs, Garlon and, Garlon and Vaseline. So anyway, got a lot of, you have a lot of options out there. How do we choose which one to use? But first I wanna talk just a little bit about why are herbicides used in forestry for that industrial forest management? Um, use. So, you know, why are they used? Well, they're used to remove competitive vegetation. So your conifer seedlings can get, can grow faster, basically. You're going to increase the conifer production cycle. Around here, you know, we're looking at about a 40 to 50 year um, harvest cycle from planting the trees to when they can be harvested for timber. We're going to reduce fuel loads for fire, and then, of course, invasive weed management also. That's why we use herbicides in the forest. Here's another reason why we use them, because we don't want to use mechanical site prep. So in the olden days, when somebody harvested trees, they would go out there and they'd take heavy equipment like this and just basically clean off the ground, try to create some bare soil to plant your trees in. Didn't work very well and it caused soil erosion, all sorts of things like that. So now, Typically, we do this with herbicides. And here you see this timber production cycle. So we're going to log the trees. So that would typically be in the uh, fall to winter time. And then that next summer, we'll prepare the site for planting, which basically means spraying any competitive grass and weeds and brush. And then that following spring, they plant the trees. Maybe a year or two later, you might have to release a few of those trees from competitive vegetation, meaning get rid of some of the weeds, grass, and brush if they're growing too fast for the trees. Sometimes have to protect trees from disease, insects, and fire. Might have to do a pre-commercial thin in 15 years. And then you wait 25 to 70 years, log the trees, and do it all over again. And I really like to point out, so for Timber production, we're often only spraying an herbicide in the forest once every 50 years. I mean, it's literally, that that's how often they do it. So in, if you compare that to a lot of other ag systems, that are, they're literally spraying almost every year. We really don't use a lot of herbicides in the forest. And here's why we do it though. You see it the, over on the left where we've done some herbicide site prep, that's all ready for trees to grow now. There's not much competition. 
over on the right is an untreated site. If you tried to plant a little seedling tree into that, it's not gonna survive the first summer. There's just too much competition for water and resources. Here you see a helicopter doing some of that aerial work. And I really like to point out the nice plantation in the background there. And there's another nice picture of that. So again, you're gonna spray this site there, create some bare ground areas to plant the trees in. And then, you know, like I said, you just wanna get a, about a two year head start from, and then all the native grasses, forbs and brush can move back in. But by that time, the trees have a head start. Let's look at some application options for doing this kind of work. We have aerial helicopters, would spray a combination of products just to get rid of, again, the grass, the forbs, and the brush. We have hand applied with backpack sprayers and waving wands. And here you see what that looks like 10 months after treatment. We're really doing something like a summer fallow. We're just trying to save the moisture so that the seedling trees can survive for a few years prior to that competition moving back in. Here you see a guy with a, um, a five gallon bucket cut in half and he's basically setting that bucket down over a seedling tree and then spraying around the seedling tree. So it's protecting that seedling tree from getting any overspray on it. And that's a really good way if you guys are out there trying to plant some trees and they get overtaken by grass and forbs and brush, you can use this method to safely spray around your trees. Just put that bucket over it, spray, and then remove the bucket. Here's a picture of what that looks like. You know, after that's done, this looks like it's almost all Canadian thistles. Nice little Douglas fir seedling there that was successfully sprayed around. And, um, you know, we don't have to get every single weed out there, but it really does help those things to survive again, like I said, the first summer or two. You can do a spot application. So if you wanna plant some trees out into a forest or out into a pasture, for instance, you can plant your tree and then just do a five foot diameter circle around that tree. All right, do I have a pointer? So what we're looking at there is a guy's got a backpack sprayer and a spray wand attachment. There we go. So he's got a backpack sprayer there with a spray wand attachment with a nozzle that points down. A tree planter's right here. So he plants the tree. This person puts a five foot diameter circle around the tree. And then that's all you have to do. It's just a five foot area to allow that tree to be free to grow. You don't have to do a helicopter application to do this type of work. And we have mixes that we'll use around different types of tree. Like for instance, Velpar L is very safe with ponderosa pine, lodgepole, dug fir, and Engelmann spruce. And then we would use things like Esplanade F and Oust. And that's going to be for larch and white pine. You cannot use the Velpar around the larch or the white pine. But there's again, a nice circle there. Very good against all that competitive vegetation that looks like grasses, mustards, prickly lettuce. And that's what that looks like if you took an aerial shot of that. It's, it's pretty cool. And again, that's just a five foot circle. It will start to grow back in within probably two to three years. But again, just gives those little tree seedlings a head start. So the question is, is it trending to do that more of this? And I would say probably not, no. It's because not really labor, it's just the, the helicopter still, you get a better, better faster growth. But this is very popular, like in Western Montana and smaller landowners use this all the time, but the larger industrial lake are still mostly helicopter. Yes. Are those trees, say, five foot circles, or are they all five foot apart? 
No, they're typically on a 10 foot spacing. So the question is, are the trees five foot apart? And no, they're typically 10 foot spacing when they do this. Kind of depends on the amount of rainfall in the area, but 10 foot's pretty average around here. No, if I was a male, I would be spotted. You know, you killed all the trees that I mm -hmm. didn't like to eat. And so I'm going to come in and hit the top of that tree. Yeah, I, the the comment was the elk are going to nip the top of those trees off, and that is definitely a problem. So sometimes we'll use um, protective netting around the trees, or we have um, big game repellents they can use as well. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Here is a picture of the meter jet spray gun. You just attach it to backpack sprayer. You pull that yellow trigger and it, again, you hold it at the right height and it does a round circle around each one of those seedling trees. What if you wanna do some brush control out on your site or you know, it might be invasive brush. Um, we can do what's called individual plant treatments. So this is something like a maple clump. Rocky Mountain maple, or maybe it's nine bark or ocean spray. You take um, a backpack sprayer and just spray that stem. Typically, we want to do that after the leaves fall off in the fall. That's the easiest time to get out there and see these stems. And the, what we typically spray is an oil, and it's just a mineral oil, and then Garlon 4 which is just a triclopyr product. And again, that goes in through the stem of that um, brush plant. And again, that could be willow, maple, um, nine bark, ocean spray, alder, all sorts of different ones. And it goes in through the bark and it will kill the brush plant. It goes down into the roots and kills the, tr the brush plant. It's very safe to do around your conifer trees. You, abrade the bark. you do not have to abrade the bark. It's got the oil penetrant that will make it go through the bark. And you can also do that after cutting a hardwood stump. You know, because typically what happens, you cut this stump, the next summer you got a hundred different <laughs> seedlings coming out of the ground next to that stump. So after you cut it, if you just spray that same um, oil and herbicide mix around the cambium layer here, right here, and kind of wrap it down the side a little bit, that will prevent that stump from sprouting the following season. If you want to kill a big hardwood but not cut it down, you can do this type of thing. So um, it's basically called hack and squirt. You make these little frills in here and then spray either straight herbicide or herbicide mixed in water into those frills. It goes into the cambium, down to the roots, and will uh, kill that tree. And there's your tools. Very simple. A hatchet and a little spray bottle. That would work too, but you can also spray spray the herbicide after you ring it with the chainsaw, yeah. <laughs> so again, don't wanna to spend too much time on this industrial side of things, but we site preparation is before you plant your trees. It's way more effective. It's safer for the seedling trees. It's typically product specific. So for instance, larch are very, they're kind of sensitive, um, but a lot of people plant them, but some of the products aren't safe with the larch. And I call this site preparation be proactive rather than reactive, because oftentimes I get a phone call that says, hey, I planted all these trees last summer and now they're dying and I have way too much competition, what do I do? And I said, I wish you would have called me the, before you planted them, because it's way easier, way safer, more cost effective, all those kind of things. But you can do release treatments as well after planting, or if you just have some naturals that are growing in the forest and you wanna make them grow faster, you can use some herbicides around those planted or natural trees and just get them to grow faster. And again, it's uh, specific to the target weeds, the conifer species. Sometimes it's the season when you can spray them and if they're, the conifers are dormant. But it is riskier for conifers, so again, I'd much rather be over in this site preparation side of things. Here's an example of 
you know, it's a site I went out to see. There's, there's actually little conifer trees underneath here. You just can't see them. And they're going to die that first season. There's probably going to get, you know, 25% survival rate. So you really do need to do some sort of control if you've got these really brushy sites with all those kind of brush species in them. Here's an example of, uh, this was um, slick leaf ceanothus, one of the harder to control brush species. We used glyphosate, rotary, and escort with a good surfactant and did a pretty nice job on that. What if you just wanna do selective treatment and save the grass on these sites? We can also do that with Garlon and Escort, these two herbicides here mixed together, a Siltax surfactant. And again, they're just walking around, spraying the competitive um, things like ferns, brush, noxious weeds, and just trying to avoid the conifers. Again, that's good, and that's gonna save the grass. Velpar L is one of the best products for ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, lodgepole pine. I really like that use through that spot and treat spot treatment system, the weed meter. Transline. So if you have conifer trees and but you also have knapweed, thistles, hawkweed, any of those kind of things, you can safely spray transline over the conifers and get control of those. Um, sunflower family weeds on these forested sites. This is labeled for conifer and tree plantations, Christmas trees, range and pasture, hay, natural areas, no grazing restrictions. Um, so very good, safe product to use around your conifer trees. I really like this um, description of it. It's the most selective herbicide for control of many noxious or invasive weeds, including mare's tail, thistles, woodland groundsel, knapweeds, hawkweeds, skeleton weed, yellow star thistle, tansy ragwort, teasel, and others. So you guys heard a lot about those weeds already. So this is gonna be a really good tool for many of the problem weeds you have in this area. Here's an example of a helicopter release. So this was a, a North Idaho plantation. And, you know, they planted it with some seedling trees and unfortunately it came back 100% to Canada thistle, but you can go right over the top of these little trees, um, virtually any conifer species, and it's gonna get control of those. And here's an example of hawkweed. Sometimes just hawkweed takes off on you, but you can, again, spray around or over the top of your conifer trees to control these weeds. Another example of some very tall Canadian thistle in, around these uh, uh, fir trees. And here's what it looks like after spraying. So a lot of products you have to be really careful of overspray, not overspraying onto the trees. So you can see how hard that would have been on this site. Um, the, the weeds were basically in the trees. So with Transline, you can spray a right into that tree and still get control. So before I leave Transline, I do want to point out we have Transline is only available in a two and a half gallon jug, but we are trying to get quarts and gallons of a product called Sonora. So that's something for Loretta to do there. I have gallons right now, but I should be able to get quarts also. Because it is pretty, it's a pretty expensive product. You use 16 ounces per acre. So even if you buy a gallon jug, it's going to do, you know, eight acres or so. Okay, so I wanted to cover some other products that we use a lot in uh, pastures, rangeland, natural areas, open spaces, wildlife areas and openings, and that's milestone. And how do we safely use milestone around trees? Because it is an awesome tool. I mean, it's a, it, it has what we call soil residual properties. So you spray the knapweed, and when you do that, you're overspraying the soil at the same time. It's gonna prevent knapweed from germinating for at least that season. So if you spray it this spring, 
it should prevent the knapweed from germinating that this next fall as well. So really good long-term control. You can really get ahead of your knapweed problem if you use um, milestone. A lot of times I hear people say, I don't want to spray my weeds because my neighbor has it and they're not controlling it. And then they're just going to blow back in. Well, that's really not the case. When you're using something like milestone, it's going to be in the soil. It's going to prevent knapweed from germinating for oftentimes a year and a half, maybe two years. So that's not a great excuse to say my neighbors have it and just because they, they're going to blow in, you can't get control. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> All right. So amino pyrrolid, it, again, I love it, this product because it's an EPA reduced risk herbicide. If a grazing animal or, or a you know wildlife eat a treated plant, it goes right through them unchanged, which is super safe for the animals. The problem is you can't have that herbicide in their manure though. So don't ever use manure in your compost pile or in your gardens if you're using milestone or any of that treated grass in your gardens. So, cause it does, it's super safe for the animals, but it is, it goes through them unchanged and then it'll be a herbicide in your, again, your garden or compost pile. So how do we spray this safely? It's pretty safe around pine, fairly safe around larch and fir and less safe around spruce. My, um, you know, my word of caution with Milestone is try to spray it after the soil has dried a little bit. If you spray it on wet, saturated soil underneath a conifer tree, then you're just asking for that to go through the water down into the roots. But if you wait until, say, early, you know, June or maybe even the middle of June, by that time, the ground is not saturated with soil and it's way less likely to go into the root system of the trees. So that was milestone. Um, I will, maybe I should point out that, let's see here. I like this one because it's got this tip and pour jug on it and you can just squeeze it up into there and about a half ounce goes into a four gallon backpack sprayer and then that, that back four gallon backpack will treat 4,000 square feet. So pretty economical. That little quart jug does 6.4 acres at the five ounce use rate. Open site, so this is milestone plus escort. So it just broadens the weed spectrum. So milestone is really good on knapweeds, thistles, hawkweeds, and this is gonna add a bunch of other weeds, actually controls 160 listed weeds on the label. Really tough ones. So things like uh, thistles, common mullein, that's a real tough one. Hound's tongue, white top, hoary crest. And then it even does some stuff like buckbrush, locust, um, thimbleberry, um, tree of heaven, some really challenging weeds. And this one comes, this one is a dry flowable material. So it comes in a one and a quarter pound package and the use rate is two and a half ounces per acre. So that one and a quarter pound package also does about six acres. It is, it's a dry product that is applied as a liquid, yeah. You just gotta get it into solution real good before you spray it out. The use rate for this one is about a quarter ounce into a four gallon backpack sprayer. What, yeah, question back there? Can you use any of this stuff here at Creeks and Lakes? You can. Um, milestone and open site are basically um, okay up to the water's edge, but I would really like you to read all the precautions about that before you use it. Seasonably dry wetlands, things like that, you can use it. It breaks down really fast once it's in the water, so that's why they're safe to use there. Um, so the sunlight and um, gets hits that in the water, it breaks down almost immediately. So. The thing you don't want to have happen is a herbicide that moves into the water and doesn't break down, then it's going to float around and hurt some hurt some plants on the shore and that type of thing. But again, open site is, um, you can spray it five months prior to planting conifers if you want to use it for growing trees, or you can apply it outside the drip line of your trees, pines, 
large spur spruce. You don't want to have any foliar contact with those conifer trees. It's very safe on grass. So it's going to release your grass. Here's what happens if it goes bad though. Like let's say you sprayed on saturated soil. You could blow out the tops of your trees. Here you see some needle curling and stuff like that. So it can damage your trees. So you have to, you do have to be careful. Again, ideally keep it out of the drip line. But here's what Tordon does. It's a little, quite a bit less safe, I would say. <clears throat> so again, that's a good reason to move back towards milestone or open site, much safer around the trees. Here's the word of caution. So when you're spraying, if you really wanna be careful, just keep it out of the drip line here. So don't spray under this area. You can with transline, like I said before, but you can't with, you shouldn't with milestone or open site. And, and if we wanna talk about being too close, we can look at this picture. They got a little too close to that one. And if you're using, if you are using Tordon, you're, more likely to want to be, you know, farther away as far away as the tree is tall, for instance, to be completely safe. You have a question, John? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. With the trans line, you say you can spray around, can you spray around fruit trees with trans line? Um, no, the question is, can you spray around fruit trees and not really? No, I just stick with 2,4-D around the fruit trees. Yeah. Here's a nice picture of how good open site works. So open site again is milestone plus escort mixed together. Here's a big mix of weeds. So we got hound's tongue, Canadian thistle. In that same site, the following season released all that grass there. It got rid of the thistle, the hound's tongue, and now the grass starts to regrow because you get rid of those competitive weeds. Here's an example of some uh, common mullein, some oxide daisy. And this was a, actually a helicopter treatment and they went a little bit wide and missed this part. And over here it was sprayed. You can see how big of a difference it made. And that's, again, that was open site. All right, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about this new product called Rejuver. Anybody here heard of Rejuver yet? Got some hands up, great. So Rejuver is almost a brand new product. It's been out for about one year now. It is labeled for rangeland, CRP, natural areas, parks, open spaces, recreation areas, wildlife areas, prairies, and fire breaks, which is gonna be really important here, and any of those sites that are grazed or cut for hay. So it's available in either quarts or two and a half gallon jugs. The quart will do about six acres. I think the two and a half gallon jug does 60 some acres. Pretty expensive product, but you're gonna, I'm gonna talk about why I think it's worth the price here. And here's the problem, these invasive annual grasses. So cheap grass, um, Vetinata, Medusa head, bulbous bluegrass, all those kind of things are invading all of our pasture sites and even into our forested areas. And it's a huge cost to ranchers, wildlife, tax pipe payers, and more. And one of the problems is this stuff dries down in June. And then when it dries down, it basically, um, if a, any kind of spark happens there it's basically just tinder ready to start it's the fire starts here and then tends to move into the wooded areas of the forest so the best, time to spray that? the best time to spray that is in any time before say july yeah, yeah. and you're what you're doing you're spraying that because that is a good question Timing's important you're trying to prevent the growth of this stuff in the fall so we spray it early in the year to prevent growth in the fall. And there's our bad players there, cheatgrass, vetinata, medusa head, bulbous bluegrass. Um, Loretta mentioned the grass snap. So grasses are really hard to identify, but you can see they do all have a different seed head here. So you can identify them with things like that grass snap app. 
Here's just another nice picture of it. And again, the reason we don't like these grasses is because they germinate in the fall, they grow really quickly in the spring, and then they go to seed in about early June. And that's just about the time your perennial grasses are starting to take off. And by, and by June, they've already used up all the water, the resources, and your perennial grass stand goes into decline, and then it's ripe for stuff like um, rush skeleton weed to move in after that, because rush skeleton weed can do okay in lower moisture. And it's got no, competitive, no, no competition from the perennial grasses because this stuff like cheatgrass has uh, moved all that out. Is, it, is that take care of witchgrass? It's gonna do real, real good on witchgrass, yes. Any annual grass, this is gonna control. So the reason you're gonna spray rejuver to decrease, because, because the perennial, or I'm sorry, the annual grasses are decreasing the quality and amount of your forage, decreasing the ecosystem diversity and wildfires. That stuff, that's where all, all our wildfires are starting typically is in that those annual grass areas on roadsides, range and pasture. Here you can see an example of what this site used to look like here. Perennial grasses, wildfires, and now just monocultures of cheatgrass. Here we had some sage grass with the annual grasses below, and then it all gets burned up, and now we have uh, nothing there. Question back there. Can uh, rejuvia be used on a pasture or grazing animals for purposes? Yes, rejuvia can be used on a grazed site like a pasture, and even some hay ground and things like that. Yeah, it's going to work real well. The, the only caution I have is if you're going to use rejuvera, don't plan on reseeding that site anytime soon because it's going to prevent your, the grass you replant into there for about four years also. So the, the big problem we've had with, print, with these annual grasses is they last for about four to five years in the soil seed bank. So if we spray them one year, then you don't spray them the second year, they go to seed again and you're back to square one. So Rejuvera lasts four years in the soil. And this shows some little planting trays with field soil. And if you sprayed them out with glyphosate each year, you can see after year three, they're starting to thin out. By year four, they're pretty much gone. And by five years, there's no more seed left. So it's just saying that the cheatgrass seed, the ventanata seed, it lasts about four years. Yes. Is that hard on wheatgrass? It is not hard on wheatgrass. It's going to be safe for all of your perennial grasses, either native or introduced grasses. So all the intermediate? Yep. All that stuff. It's very safe for those. It's, it just works on annual grasses. Okay. So very safe for all your perennials. But again, we so it lasts four years. So if you spray rejuvera on the ground, it's going to prevent germination for four years and by that fifth year you got no more seed left there so that's how this is going to work it's going to get rid of that seed bank and by year five you've got you've gotten rid of that and you just have your nice green perennial grasses now and the way it does that is it ties up really shallow in the soil where all those annual grasses germinate and it just prevents germination the seed starts to germinate, it picks up the herbicide, and then the seed dies. And again, after five years, all the seed is gone, and the perennials are free to grow. And it's safe, again, on perennial grasses and even your perennial wildfire flowers. Yes? Does it come in quart or gallon? It does come in quart bottles, so yeah. And in two and a half gallon jugs is the next size. So you can, it's I like, like I say, it's great to try on your fence lines, anywhere where those annual grasses are moving in. You can just do a little bit each year to get rid of it. Is there a shelf life on these products? No shelf life on these products. You just want to keep them from freezing. And then shake them up real good before you use them. But also, what you're saying is though it assumes that you have some perennials. In yeah, that's a great question. So we are... A, assuming and hoping you have some perennial grasses there to release because 
like I said, if you spray this and all you had was cheat grass, you're gonna have bare ground after that. Yeah. Yes. The rate per acre is five ounces per acre. Uh, no. Well, it, it's more expensive than the milestone, but it lasts for you know, like I said, four to five years. So it's yeah. So it's an investment, but it lasts. You know, it like I said, it lasts. I have a couple questions online. Okay. So there's one about what about using it in wet wetland areas in your pasture? So question question is using it in wetland areas in the pasture. As long as they're dry when you apply it, it should be okay. And again, it ties up very shallow that first half inch, so it's not going to move. But yeah, it's got to be a dry area when they spray it. So. And Rejuva, does it keep the perennial grasses from receding? Uh, it would keep the perennial grasses from receding. Yeah, it's it's any seed that's going to germinate for you know, about four years, it's going to prevent germination. Yeah. But if they're spreading from the rhizomes or roots, it's not going to prevent any of that. How would you recommend the spray in that fence line that killed everything? Um, probably, um, let's see here. I would recommend a product called um, uh, Flumi Guard. And Flumi Guard? Yeah, we have, and we have that in small packages. So mix that with Roundup and yeah, it would work great. Or the other one would be Roundup. Quick Pro TC. Quick Pro TC. TC, total control. That's the new Esplanade Easy. Yeah. Okay, I want to move on to. So, again, safe for perennial grasses, forbs, and shrubs, and it's safe, very safe around trees as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you can't plant grass for four years, but you can plant legumes. You cannot, no. It's going to prevent broadleaf plants and grasses. So you, you like I said, you want to be pretty sure you got a good grass stand before you use this, but it has been my experience. You got way more grasses there than you think. Once you get rid of that cheat grass, they really take off, the perennial grasses take off. Here's a nice example of that. Over here is no treated. You get that uh, annual grass dry down look. They tends to be kind of purplish cheat grass, especially after you treat. Just solid perennial grasses and forbs there as well, some sages and things like that. Here's another example, no treatment on the left, rejuver on the right. And again, you see, this is what it looks like in June when this stuff starts to grow, die down. And you don't ever, after that happens, you almost never get any perennial grass growth after that because the annuals have used all the moisture. Over here, where there's lots of moisture, these perennial grasses are just taken off. And there is some bare ground here, but those will oftentimes fill in as these spread a little bit. Here you can see another nice before and after uh, shot. Again, just this uh, crappy looking annual grasses. And over here, big thick perennial grasses taken off. <laughs> Probably isn't actually because this this is the, this is the color of those annual grasses in June typically. Yeah. So this application timing is really important. So cheatgrass, inventinata, all those things germinate in the fall after we get fall rain and. Um, some cold temperatures. So you want this to be in the soil for ready for that to happen. So we're actually recommending that you apply Rejuvera as early as, you know, the end of July at the latest. And again, you're not trying to control the cheat grass that's out there in July. You're trying to prevent the cheat grass that's going to germinate in October. Um, because they actually, anytime you get some rain, especially in the higher elevations, you can start, it can start to germinate. And that can even happen in August if we get a bunch of August rain. So you really want to get out there prior to any of that happening, have that rejuver ready to roll as soon as you get uh, any type of moisture. And then that's going to prevent germination all fall long. And it, well, again, and then for four years after that. So early 
early uh, May and July through July application timing with Rejuvra. If you apply after that, they actually recommend a tank mix with Plateau because then the Plateau will kill the um, um, any of the cheat grass that's already emerged. <laughs> so you can do this with an airplane. Look at these skips out there. I think that's kind of interesting to see. They should have flown a little narrower there. But you can also do four wheelers, um, uh, tractors, backpack sprayers, all sorts of different methods. But uniform coverage is critical. They actually have a pretty cool um, program that if you sign up for this range view, with range view, it costs three dollars an acre, and they have satellite imagery will locate all of the cheat grass and vent knot and that type of stuff on your property and tell you where to spray. And if you sign up for that range view, they actually give you a four year control guarantee on those grasses, and they'll give you the three dollars back after that four years. So it's a pretty neat program. So why are we gonna reuse Rejuvra? Just as a review, we're gonna see increased ranch profitability, increased wildlife and pollinator habitat, reduced wildfire threat. That's probably my biggest reason why I think that's really important because I mean, I just, over the years, that's where the fires are starting on the roadsides where the cheat grass is and the, that rangeland forest interface when you have those dry grasses. They don't, they don't start in the green perennial grasses. They start in these dry annual grassy sites. Increased forage and plant diversity and extended noxious weed control. Whoa. Okay. Here we see a nice natural area. If, it, if you've got wildflowers, forbs, and grass and perennial grasses, you can actually release all those with Rejuver because it's only controlling plants coming from seed. It's not gonna impact any of these perennials that are already there. And again, there's just an example of all the different grasses that's gonna control, but any annual grass really. I'm just gonna go through these slides really quick. Um, but this is showing the first summer after treatment with Rejuver. And what we're looking at is percent, percent invasive annual grass cover. So untreated without spraying anything, over 50% of your pasture, for instance, is invasive annual grasses. The first summer after treatment, so that means you applied it this summer, next summer we go out and look, Rejuvra is, you know, about 10% invasive annual grass. These other competitive herbicides are about the same. But then look what happens that second year after treatment. Rejuvra is all of a sudden 5% doing its job. The other products are basically given up. And we still have the over 50% in the untreated. Year three, third summer after treatment. Still 5% with Rejuvra. Year four, still holding on. The other ones are basically untreated now. Still less than 5%. And we already saw that slide. Increased 2.5% increase in perennial grass production. So if you're trying to graze, grow grass for hay or forage, you're going to get way more grass out there, 2.5 times more the production. And there's if you use some competitive products. So very worthwhile using this. And I do want to point out, I left some of these slides out, but if you use Rejuver and Milestone together, for instance, you oftentimes are going to see the same four-year control on knapweed as well, because you all of a sudden you have the competitive grass now and the milestone working on it. And I, like I said, I left the slides out, but I had all sorts of neat slides showing Canadian thistle control, knapweed control for four years, and that annual grass control for four years.
How am I doing on time? All right, I'm about eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. I got lots of time then, okay. So we have a new herbicide called High Noon. And this one is a, it's basically a very similar to Milestone and Open Site. But it's got a, whoops, it's got a, it's got a new active ingredient in it. Um, this slide says, lose a pound of weeds, grow a pound of grass, and you can basically, uh, it's, it's got a new product in there called Arlex. And the reason I wanna talk about that is it's really good on a lot of the weeds we talked about today in that um, uh, wild carrot family. So it's, it's good on all the weeds that Milestone is good on, but it uh, adds a lot of different weed control with some different weed species. And there you see, um, these are all synthet synthetic oxen herbicides, but with um, high noon, it actually adds a different mode of action. So now all of a sudden you're getting two different modes of action, which is very good for resistance management. How much more expensive is it? It's actually cheaper. Really? Yeah, you would have lost that bet, I'm pretty sure. So the question was, how much more expensive is it? And it's actually quite a bit less expensive than Milestone. So, um, and it's less expensive than Open Site as well. It comes in a gallon container and the use rate is 12 to 20 ounces per acre. This new active ingredient is called Rinscore that they're mixing with the Milestone. And you can see how little you're using per acre. It's 0.19 grams active ingredient per acre. That's like nothing that's going out there, but it's really effective. Broad range of use sites, rangeland, permanent grass pastures, non-crop, natural areas, gonna be very safe to use around trees again, as long as you keep it out of the drip line and don't overspray on your conifer trees. Yeah. 16 to 20 ounces. So 16 ounces would be equal to five ounces of milestone. 20 ounces would be equal to seven ounces of milestone. Practically non-volatile, low odor, very, very safe on your grass. And it's got a whole bunch of weeds on the label. There you see all those. So again, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to add like a half ounce of Escort occasionally, but this by itself gets just about everything. And whoops, go back to that one. Um, so again, wild carrot, Poison hemlock, we talked about that one. Um, buckhorn plantain. Anyway, it's this, you know, the the hemlock and the wild carrot in particular is what it's really good on, in addition to nap weeds, thistles, hawkweed, all that kind of stuff. And there we see just some good uh, common mullen control with it as well. Untreated. This one says Duracor. Sorry, but it's the same same product as High Noon. Um, see all the uh, untreated over there, and then we got um, some nice release over there. So again, rangeland, permanent grass pastures, including grasses grown for hay, but it does have milestone in it. So if you're growing hay to sell off farm, you can't use any of these amino pyrrolic products. You can use it only on your own farm and you have to watch out for things like, again, the compost, the uh, garden soil, all that kind of thing. So always, I've talked about a lot of different products, a lot of different places to use these products. So please read and follow all your label instructions. The label is the law also happens to be very informative. For instance, it's gonna tell you the use sites. It's not all coming across on this PowerPoint for some reason, no, there it is, okay. So it's gonna tell you the use sites where you can use these products, the active ingredient that's in there, 
this the warrant the signal word or the warning word your personal protective equipment so what kind of gloves you have to wear eye protection clothes socks shoes all that kind of stuff all right so again i am more than happy to answer any questions i can send you a pdf of this program if you need it there's my email address and um, we have quite a bit of time left if you guys want to ask any questions about any of the products i talked about yeah i consider uh, praying for a weed of my <laughs> Yes. So the question is, he's got grand fur and kind of considers it a weed. And I know a lot of people that agree with you. They, you know, it comes in so thick, it just chokes everything out. So yeah, you can use um, Escort and you could mix it with a little bit of Garlon or Vaseline and have a good oil surfactant with it. But Escort is primarily what I would recommend, about two ounces per acre. And you want to spray it when the new needle growth is coming out on those grand fur. And that should so suck all that in and kill it roots and all. With a surfactant. With a surfactant, like Siltac surfactant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so best time to use open site is either the spring or fall. So almost all the weeds we talk about, knapweeds, thistles, hawkweed, have a rosette that comes out in the early spring. And you can spray it until, you know, they get about this tall. So that's a very good time. They're easy to find in that rosette stage. Or, so I recommend go out and spot sp spray all you can in the spring. And then go back out there in the fall after the fall rains. And those same rosettes are going to come back again. And you can go treat whatever you missed in the fall. We have an online. Okay. So my property is next to high voltage power lines in the North County. Do you happen to know which treatment BPA tends to use the most for the high voltage power line corridor? Do you work with them at all, Joel? Yeah, a little bit, but I, I, I don't know what they're using, honestly. They're, they're, the BPA and all those people, they are required by law to control primarily trees from growing into the power lines because it's a huge expense if all those, if a tree grows into the power line. So they're primarily just using things that are gonna kill the conifer trees. And it could be a Mazapir and Escort, but they oftentimes are using the same things that we're using like open site and milestone to control noxious weeds also. Question. Yes. That would uh, prevent the spread of cottonwood trees from stumps that have been left? Yeah, so the question is how about controlling uh, cottonweed, I'm sorry, cottonwood sprouts after you've cut the stumps? And that product I mentioned, um, Garlon and oil mixed together, you spray the cut stumps and that'll prevent those from reshooting, um, re-sprouting rather. And the other thing you can use is um, Vaslan and Escort on the sprouts. You can just spray those sprouts with the, with the herbicide and that'll kill those as well. But the Vaslan and Escort. But yeah, the, the really the big key is to spray those stumps after you cut them. Like it really, if you can do it immediately after cutting, you just spray them with um, garlon and oil the, around the cambium layer and down the stump about six inches and you shouldn't have any re-sprouts the next season. Yeah. Yes. Is there a uh, compost? The trans line is not real safe for compost either. So yeah. Um, it's not as long lived as the milestone and those things, but you do have to, like if you if you put treated hay into the compost, it's not gonna break down in the compost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, or, uh, or oil is that so oil is, could be, all those labels actually allow you to use diesel. If you wanna use diesel, I tend to, I sell something called web oil, which is just a mineral oil that's not as smelly as diesel and that type of stuff, but um, it's, or even a methylated seed oil surfactant will work as well. You just need an oil to get it to go into the woody part of that plant. And I, and I, I wanted to give everybody a clarification on that, the compost problem. So these herbicides break down from soil microbes and you have to have a living soil microbe um, to, to, they basically eat the herbicide for food. 
their sugars and that type of thing in there. And in the compost pile, it gets so hot that it actually kills the soil microbes because that heat is too hot for the soil microbes. So what happens is that the treated hay or the manure goes in there, then the, the heat kills the microbes and they just don't break down. So if the best way to break these products down or the manure is to mix them with field soil or grasses and just have some nice moisture. And, you know, they break down really quick if you can keep them in an area like that. But unfortunately, the compost doesn't do it. Okay. Yes. 75% oil, 25% garlon. And it's garlon four. Okay, we're going to do one more quick online question and then break for lunch. So, can rejuvera be used in semi open forest understory? Uh, I would say yes, it can. Rejuvera can be used in semi open forest understory because it's very safe around the trees. Um, it's not going to be taken up to the root system or anything like that. So, yeah, it'd be super safe. Yeah. All right, there again, there's my email. If there's any follow up questions we didn't get to, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you.